Hey, if you've got your Bible, because that's why we've gathered here on this Lord's Day, let's go to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, although I will warn you, that is not where I'm going to preach from, but it is where I want to begin. We've been on a journey. Your theme of your missions conference in 2023 has been compelled by his love. On Friday night, we looked at the letter to the church at Ephesus where we focused on the fact that what happens when God steps in and corrects our understanding of his love. Where often in our churches, we can be more in love with our stands than our Savior. And we're not truly going to be compelled by the love of Christ if we don't understand and have the correct understanding of his love. Then last night, we looked at the number one emotion attributed to both God in the Old Testament and Jesus Christ in the New, which is compassion. And what does it mean to be compelled by an emotion that actually has action? We can often be sympathetic in our churches, but we're often not compassionate in our churches. And that is to put love into action. Now today, I want to consider how Christ prays for our mission to be fueled by his truth. But before I look at actually our passage, which is actually in John 17, I want to read Matthew chapter 28, which contains probably the most famous missions passage in the Bible that is often preached at every missions conference, and that is the last few verses of this chapter. But I want to read the whole chapter for you very quickly, and I want you to do me a favor. I want you to take notice of the emotions of the chapter. All right, here is what Matthew records as he be finishes up his gospel, wanting the Jews to know that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He says, now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to, to see the tomb, and behold, and that's the key terminology of Matthew's gospel. Anytime you see that word behold, he wants you to pay attention there was a great earthquake, and why? For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. In other words, they fainted out of fear. And the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he is risen as he said. And then he invites them, come see the place where he lay. And then watch, they're immediately commissioned. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. And there you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. And ran to tell his disciples, and behold, here's the third time, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet, and they worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid, go and tell my brothers, go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And while they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers, and here's why, and said, tell them, or tell the people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while he was still asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed, and this story has spread among the Jews to this day. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, I watch this, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And here's the final, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Now, would you do me a favor and go forward a few gospels to the gospel of John, John chapter 17. Now, while you're doing that, 
I want to talk to us this morning about the idea that how are we going to be compelled by his love if you understand that Jesus Christ is praying for us right now. Would that not compel us in his love to be on mission? And tonight, if you come back tonight, I am very excited. I want to preach from the passion of Jesus Christ and actually show us and culminate our conference with the idea that Christ himself compels us with his love by a sacrifice. And I want us to think about two gardens, the Garden of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane. But as I was reading Matthew chapter 28, I asked you to take note of the emotions. And I want to ask you, did you feel the emotions of the passage? Often we read our Bible and we simply read it as text without actually allowing ourselves to feel the humanity of what is being written about. The guards are so afraid they pass out. The ladies needed assurance not to be afraid. And can you imagine how some of these same ladies felt when they saw Jesus? And they grab his feet and they worship him. And yet, as we read, Jesus immediately commissions them to go and be witnesses for him. And then we see the panic of both the guards and the religious establishment. And then their plan of deception and denial. And of course, then Jesus calls his disciple, both men and women, and they resurrected Jesus Christ comes. But notice, when they gather together, they worship him, but Matthew wants us to know that some doubted. Now, can I ask us all something here this morning? Can you not relate to that? Can you not relate to that roller coaster of emotions? Then we get what is many is called the Great Commission. I want you to hang on to that terminology. But if you'll allow me now to roll the clock back a few weeks and you turn to John chapter 17, I want you to look at verses 17, 18, and 19, okay? This is Jesus Christ, likely somewhere in the Kedron Valley, making his way to the Garden of Gethsemane, he stops with these 11 disciples and he prays. This is the longest recorded prayer in the entire Bible of Jesus Christ. Anthony Burgess, the old Puritan, preached on this chapter and preached 145 sermons from these 26 verses. Think about that. This is verses 17, 18, and 19. Jesus prays, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And then he says, and for their sake, watch this now, I consecrate myself. Why? That they also may be sanctified, notice this, in truth. Now, these are the last of the second session of section of God, Jesus' great consecration prayer. John 17 can be broken into three groups, verses 1 to 6, 17 to 19, and 20 to 26. This is hours before his betrayal. Jesus will be captured and tortured and crucified. And somewhere after that final meal and the institution of the Lord's Supper, before he actually gets to the Garden of Gethsemane, as many believe he's crossing the Kedron Valley. He's with the 11. Judas has already left and been dismissed to betray Jesus. And these 11 disciples are still confused. They're still doubting. And I want you to think about and feel the tension and the emotions of all they've heard over the last few hours. If you were to read John 13, 14, 15, and 16, the great farewell discourse of Jesus with his disciples. He has given them promises of power, and yet Jesus told them he was leaving them. He also told them the world would hate them and that he was going to die, and yet he promised them a comforter was going to come and they would know what to do and how to speak. He warns them that the world is going to turn on them as they've turned against Jesus. In John 14, they've heard promises of heaven. They've heard the assurance of a place with Jesus, the promise that he would come and reget them and bring them back with him, and yet... The final words of Jesus to these disciples in John 16 are these. Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet, Jesus says, I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you. Why? That in me you may have peace. Now, notice these words. 
In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now again, I want to ask you as Devon Park Baptist Church, does this not seem familiar to us today? Promises mixed with tribulation, assurance and yet feelings of doubt, a sense of knowing, all the while a sense of not knowing or sometimes even being confused. Can we admit that there's times that we're afraid and we doubt and we wonder? We've been told about heaven, we've been told about how great eternity is, and yet is it any wonder that Jesus stops and prays for these 11? Now I want you to stop and just realize this, okay? Jesus Christ, right now, is in heaven praying for you. Now I want you to grasp that. Anyone who trusts and believes in Jesus as both Savior and Lord is a Christian. That's the Bible that tells us that. Is loved and adopted and cared for and accepted and cherished by God as Father. And as his Father, he loves us so much, he tells us the truth. God transforms us and empowers us. He calls us as people to walk by faith, to actually become, are you ready for this? Like him. But he promises that he will give us the power to do that. He promises his love and his patience for the process of doing it. And what's more is he gives us the blueprint for how to accomplish it, and that is his word. And you have to look no further than John 17. Hours before his death. The disciples are going through some of the worst anxiety and doubts. They are confused and they are thinking, Jesus, will you either take us to heaven or overcome and conquer all the evil around us? But maybe some of them are wondering, is it all a lie? What are we doing here? Because we're hurting and we're scared and we really don't think we can pull this off. And then as they're walking to the, through the Gedron Valley, Jesus prays. But again, I want you to feel and relate to these emotions, these doubts, these horrors of life, the anxiety or tribulation and even attack, the sense of weakness and overwhelming, the sense of it's too much. There's an expression we have in the West that says, out of the mouths of babes. When I was studying for this sermon, I came across a story by Pastor Ralph Keeper. He says he was preaching at a missions conference in Deerfield Street, New Jersey, and he talked about this little girl that was a part of his church. Her name was Mary, and she was eight years old. He was sitting in his office, and Mary walked by the hallway, and his door was open, and she stopped and timidly, as an eight-year-old would, tapped on the door and wanted to know if she had permission to come into the pastor's office. She did, and they said hellos and exchanged pleasantries, and then Mary said, can I ask you a question, pastor? Sure, absolutely. And she said, I want you, to, want you to know about something that I learned in Bible school this morning. And so he asked the child, what was it? And she says, is it okay if I just want to go to heaven now and not live any longer? An eight-year-old. Now, Keeper said that he's learned that he should never just give an answer to a child without knowing why they're asking the, tr- the question. So he said, what, why do you want to ask this? And she said, well, it's because of what I learned in Bible school this morning. And she said, we were taught that heaven is a wonderful place. That in heaven there's no fear and no crying, no fighting. And it's just to be with the Lord. And won't that be wonderful? We were taught that when we die, we will be with Jesus. Pastor Keeper, did I hear that right? And he said, yes, you did, Mary. But I need to know, why do you want to go right now? You're so young. You've got all kinds of growing up to do and learning yet to do. And then she said these words to her pastor. Pastor, you've been to my house. And you know my mom and my dad. They don't love Jesus. Often they drink too much and they get drunk. So we have to get ourselves up in the morning. Often I make breakfast for my little brother and we go to school with dirty clothes. Often the children make fun of us, and when we come home again, we hear fighting, and we hear other things that make us afraid, and we hide in our bedroom. So, Pastor, why wouldn't I want to go to heaven right now? Wouldn't heaven be better? J.M. Boyce writes of this encounter. He says, it's clear that Mary did not believe in theoretical theology. She believed in practical theology, and she was facing a very practical problem. 
What she was really asking is, was, why are we in the world anyway? If this world is such a sin-cursed place and heaven is such a blessed place, why do we have to stay here? Why does God not take us to heaven immediately upon our conversion? And this wise young pastor said to this wee little girl, Mary, there's only one reason in God's world why we are here. And that is that through our testimony, by our life and by our words, we might have the privilege of bringing people, other people, to a sailing, saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He then prayed with this wee little girl, and he reminded her that maybe through her life and testimony, her parents would come to know the Lord. And 17 years later, Mary was able to lead her mom to Christ. Now, I want you to notice with me again that Jesus has prayed in John 17 for his disciples. He's prayed for their protection and their provision. He's prayed for their gospel assurance and gospel unity. He has then prayed for the results of that. If you read the whole chapter, he talks about having joy and holiness and truth and mission and love. You see, Devin Park, the old hymn is still the same and still true. Sometimes the day seems long, does it not? And our trials are hard to bear. We're tempted, aren't we, to complain and to murmur and despair. But Christ will soon appear and catch his bride, the church, away. All tears forever over in God's eternal day. Why? Because it will be worth it all. Amen? Amen. It will be worth it all when we see Christ. And if you're going to be compelled by his love, then one of the ways you're going to be compelled by his love is you, when you realize that Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, not only prayed for you, but is praying for you. But we must take notice of what he has prayed. Notice with me in verse 17, he prays that we will communicate his truth. Jesus says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. According to Jesus, what was the best protection for his disciples? According to his prayer, it was the word of God. I can't stress this enough. I know our kids are downstairs and they're learning their Christmas program and all these things. But do you remember that kid's song that we were taught? If you've been around Christianity, read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day. And what happens? You'll grow, grow, grow. Again, my grandfather said it doesn't have to be complicated to be profound, right? This is what we need to do. To make his disciples holy and to provide spiritual power that will enable them to rise above the burdens and the doubts and the fear of their world, Jesus says, sanctify them in your truth. By the way, in the Greek, that's both in and by. It means in the truth that the disciples would be immersed in God's word, and it's the means by which they would be uh, discipled. It's by the truth that God's truth will be the change in their lives. Oh, I wish that at Devon Park and at churches like Calvary Baptist, where they're worshiping God right now in Newfoundland as well, we live on a continent in one of two countries where we can have access to the Bible more than ever before, and yet... Only one in 10 professing Christians today says they read their Bible regularly. One in 10. And then we wonder why our emotions get the best of us. Right? This is where we are called. Jesus begins this and he says, your word is truth. So that's actually the third level. Christ to the spirit, to the word. And it's the means by which the disciples would grow in their holiness. Holiness is thinking as God would have us think. And living as God would have us live as defined in his word. Listen to these words. One person wrote, as we stumbled down the hill... I felt the little Bible bumping on my back. And as long as we had that, I thought, we could face even hell itself. You know who wrote those words? A young Corey Tin Boone as she stepped out of the train car and on the ground in a Nazi death camp. 
do you and I have this kind of relationship with our Bibles? That when we want to know how to handle our marriages and our families and our jobs and our finances and our mental struggles and our depression and our anxiety and our fears and the sins that seem to battle us and our upbringing and all these things, that as long as I have my Bible, I can face anything. Or is the Bible, like most men, treat instructions? After they've tried everything else, then they go look. Have you ever noticed that about men? Come on, men, own your sin. I put stuff together with my wife all the time, and I'm always convinced that I can put it together until I get halfway in and realize there's this peace, and I have no idea where it goes. And then I say to Debbie, bring me the instructions. Too many of us treat our Bible that way. Jen Wilkin goes even further. She says, if you have a view of God that is inconsistent with Jesus, then you don't have a God who should be worshipped, but an idol that should be destroyed. And this is why Paul says what he does in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. He's simply putting to life a directive of Jesus' prayer. That's why he says, I beseech you, brethren and sisters, by the mercies of God, be ye transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. One man has said, you can read the Bible, you can quote the Bible, you can even memorize the Bible, but unless the author of the Bible lives inside you, you'll never truly understand the Bible or live the Bible. And that's just true. And again, J.C. Ryle was still right. Happy is the man or woman who possesses a Bible. Happier still is he or she who actually reads it, but happiest of all is he or she who reads it and obeys it. So how are you going to be compelled by his love? If you don't realize that Jesus' prayer for us was that we would know his word. We would be in his word. When I was young, like some of these young teenage boys I'm seeing here, I would go to missions conferences and I would hear the story of the great missions uh, father who said, give me 100 men or women sold out to Jesus and I'll change the world. I still think that's true, by the way. But I would love to see 100 men and women in a church who read the word regularly. And I think you'll change a church. And you'll change a community. But notice in verse 18, then Jesus prays for our commission. But notice this, with his power. He says, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Pray, he, Jesus prays for our commission with his power. The Christian attitude is also to be one of mission. And you'll notice it's not isolation, nor is it assimilation. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the king's doctor, said, the business of the gospel is to bring people to God and to reconcile them to God. Are you ready for this? Not to fill churches. It's not to have good statistics. It's to reconcile men and women to God, to save them from the wrath to come. I told you on Friday night that I go up at least once a week on Signal Hill to look out over my city, and I'm reminded of the 250-odd thousand people there that if Jesus Christ comes back today, over 248,000 of them will face God as judge and not as father. And I've asked God to break my heart with that, to realize this is my mission field. These are the men and women and the families God has called me to just weep for and long for. You have some beautiful bridges here, and every time I I go over them, I get different perspectives of this city of Fredericton. When was the last time, as I told you last night, 63,000 people in this city, how many of them know Jesus? And by the way, if you're here this morning and you're searching, I want you to know, you can live any way you want and you'll get to God. Seth is surrounded by this in Toronto. People that dance around golden statues and all these things. Any way you want to live, you will get to God. But there's only one way to get to God as Father, and that's through Jesus Christ. Any other way you live, you will get to God, but you will meet him as judge. And it's a fearful thing to stand before the holy judgment of God. And yet, Devon Park, you have the answers. It's not because you're better people. In fact, if you're here and you admit that God has saved you, you're actually admitting that you're a sheep and you're the foolishness of the world. Because God said that he chooses the foolish to confound the wise. So as Christians, we should be some of the most patient, calm people Because we realize 
what an almighty loving God has done for us. And so we can do and be patient and lovingly tell over and over again these things. The goal of the gospel, my friends, is not to affirm you. It's not to celebrate you and empower you to do whatever you want. The goal of the gospel is to rescue you and transform you and then empower you to do whatever God wants you to do. You see, Michael Foster says, nothing grows a Christian like a serious commitment to God's word and a local church week in and week out for years and years. It's not conferences, it's not social media, it's not even your personal devotions. The local church is where mature Christians are slowly forged in the fires of mundane faithfulness. Do you want to be a stronger church? Be committed to Christ and his word and each other. This is what will confound your communities when you truly act like a family. Eternal life, by the way, is a commission to the fulfillment of God's work. As men and women labor in Christ, they live in Christ, for they know they can only find purpose through him. Eternal life for the sons and daughters of God is not luxurious idleness, but purposeful labor in which we realize that our best destiny is what the Father offers, offers us. So what does it mean to be in the world but not of the world as Christians? Well, J.M. Boyce says, it doesn't mean that we are like the world, and it doesn't mean we pull away from the world. It means this, and Seth talked about it this morning. It means we are to know non-Christians, befriend them, enter into their lives in such a way as we begin to infect them with the gospel rather than they're infecting us with their worldliness. Where are the missionaries of this church? Not just the full-time ones, the everyday ones. But notice in verse 19, Jesus sums this up and he prays for our consecration through his sacrifice. He says, Lord, for their sake I consecrate myself. Why? That they also may be sanctified again in truth. I've said it before. Jesus, when he prays this prayer, he's only hours. 12 to 16 hours from now, he'll be betrayed by Judas with a kiss, tortured and condemned, mocked, and crucified, and then die. So in the earshot of his disciples, and for you and I to read and consider, Jesus was sent to die. That was his mission. Jesus, who was set apart and consecrated for this mission. He was born to make God known. He was born and lived to make a way for a holy God to forgive and transform and adopt unholy sinners like me and you. Jesus was sanctified, set apart for this task. Why? So that God would redeem for himself a people. You and me, if you know him, anyone who will trust Jesus Christ, trust who he is, why he came, what he said. And we do this by confessing and repenting, placing our trust in him. And then God forgives us and adopts us and transforms us and empowers us and guides us and indwells us, indeed sanctifies us. You see, that's why Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is so popular. And many of you here at Devon Park can quote it, right? For by grace are you saved through faith that is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, right? Not of works, lest any man or woman should boast. The tragedy is we stop quoting the scripture there. You need to keep going to verse 10. But we are his workmanship. That's the Greek word poema, where we get our English word poetry. Paul wants this church to know, you didn't save yourselves. God saved you because you're his poetry. He is the one that has crafted your life, has purpose for your life, meaning for your life. He has a, a, a set of things that you're going to accomplish and how you're going to represent him. This is what Pastor Keeper was trying to get young Mary to understand. Her life was a poem. So it doesn't matter how jacked up your life is. doesn't matter how you think that you have regrets and things didn't go at all the way you planned them. God is not up in heaven with his arms folded doing this. God is delighting in you through Jesus Christ by his obedience and his sacrifice. I said this before, I'm the grandfather of six, and I know that's really hard for you to believe because I look so young, all right? I get it. But I have six grandchildren, and you know what? I'm a better parent the second time around. I gotta, I'm just being, admitting that to you. 
But have you ever noticed what happens when young parents or grandparents watch their child take that first step? What happens? Think about it. What happens, right? There's a Facebook post. There's an Instagram post, right? There's phone calls. There's videos, right? That, you know, and you know what those little infant babies are like. I can see some of them now where their head is way too big for their body, and they're like a bobblehead doll, and they finally pull themselves up, and they take that first step, and everybody just rejoices. What grandparent or parent, when that baby first takes that first step and then flops over because the weight of that enormous head takes over the gravity, what grandparent or parent ever goes, that's all you could do was one step. Well, that's not impressive. I've been feeding you for 10 months now, and that's the best you got? A step? No, how do we react? We're overjoyed. We take pictures. We tell everybody, my little boy took a step. My little girl took a step. My granddaughter took a step. What do you think? The King of kings and the Lord of lords who is seeing you through the perfection and the blood of Jesus, when you take one wobbly, awkward step towards him, even though you fall down, he still lets heaven know, that's my child, and they're taking steps towards me. And he can say it because Jesus sacrificed himself for you and me. You know, sometimes the world gets it right. You remember that Shania Twain song, that don't impress me much? Too many of us as Christians are trying to, trying to impress God. And you don't have to. He already loves you. He delights in you. Because he sees you through the perfection of Jesus. So you don't have to run from your sin and hide it. You don't have to make excuses for your sin. You don't have to blame others for your sin. You can take yourself as messed up and as weak as you are and bring it to Jesus. Think about the 11 people with him. He has just said, you're all going to leave me and go home. He has told Peter, the guy who runs his mouth more than anybody, you're going to deny me three times before this night is out. And yet, this is the same Jesus who would cook breakfast by the Sea of Galilee and call Peter over and restore him back to ministry. So when you struggle, don't hide it. Don't make excuses. Don't blame. Run to Jesus. Run to his truth. Take that wobbly, awkward first step. You will see it. You don't earn your salvation. You don't have to keep it. You can't lose it, and it won't be taken from you. Devin Park, the devil can't rob you. The world can't steal it from you. You are his, and he is yours for eternity. Amen? This is the gospel. Because Jesus consecrated himself, we can be consecrated for him, by him, to him. We couldn't be holy or sanctified or consecrated to God if God did not first sanctify himself on our behalf. That's the good news. That's redemption. Stop running, stop making excuses, stop being on the hamster wheel of life and being sifted by the lies and defeat of Satan and a world system that says look out for yourself because friends, that's a lonely life, that's a delusional life and that's why this culture is more tired and frustrated and angry than ever before and it's creeping into our churches because we're not resting and responding to the love of Jesus displayed by his holiness and his mercy and his grace. And I get it. We're all tempted to be like Mary. I just want to go to heaven. But we have a purpose. Jesus did God's will and spoke God's word and accomplished God's mission so that we can do Jesus' will, read and speak Jesus' word, and accomplish Jesus' me, uh, mission. Scotty Smith says, Jesus' empty tomb, occupied throne, constant intercession, steadfast love, lordship over everything, perfect righteousness, perfectly dated return are all ours because God made them ours by his amazing grace. So he says, rest, dear friends, and let's live and love to his glory. So right now, if you will come to Jesus, he not only accepts you and forgives you, but then he intercedes for you. He's your advocate. He proclaims and declares with nail-scarred hands and feet, they are mine. 
Is it any wonder that Paul would say in Ephesians 5 that Jesus is the one that will present us without spot or wrinkle? Do you ever wonder why Paul uses marriage as his illustration in Ephesians? Because is not marriage one of the great illustrations of how we need truth to fuel the mission of marriage so that we can be sanctified? You know what one of the greatest miracles to me is? Is that Debbie is still my wife. Because she knows me. And she knows what an inconsistent hypocrite I can be. And she still loves me. And God loves me more than that. You remember it was Paul Tripp who said, marriage is not about your happiness, by the way. It's about your holiness. And so was the Christian life. Tim Keller, who's gone on to be with the Lord, talked about him and his wife, Kathy, making sure they understood that they could be each other's husband and wife, but they could not be each other's savior. And here's why. He said, one or the other of us is going to look down at the other person in a coffin one day, and if our savior is in that coffin, how will he help us when our heart is breaking? And then he says this, you can't follow Jesus and hold hands with the devil at the same time. This is just true. And this is why Jesus prays this prayer. Devon Park, family, Jesus and only Jesus can be our Savior. No one else can. Your mom or dad can't. Your wife or husband can't. Your friend or special someone can't. Your son or daughter can't. Your grandparent kids can't. The government can't. Your famous preacher can't. No pastor or church can. Only Jesus who is praying for us right now. And that's the beauty of it. And so let me ask you as I close, the answer of the church, if we're going to be compelled by his love, is we are to look inward to find joy. Inward, because this is where the Spirit of God indwells us. We're to look Christward and find our sanctification. We're to look to the Scriptures and find truth. But the church is also to look outward to the world and there find the object of our God-given mission. Jesus wants us to be a joyful church and a holy church and a truthful church and a missional church. But Jesus prayed for his disciples. They were far from perfect. Quite frankly, some of their worst days were yet to come. But our Savior and Lord sees our whole life. This is what I love about this. Again, I talked about it last night. You remember that woman at the well? Five failed marriages and living with her boyfriend. And Jesus speaks to her, respects her, tells her the truth, calls her to worship. And her first thing, her first instinct was to run into the town where likely she was marginalized and she was gossiped about and she was mocked and she was ignored. And she went into the faces of all those people that had judged her and she said, come meet the one who told me all the things I've ever done. Could this not be the Messiah? You see, when you really know Jesus and are compelled by his love, shame and guilt go away. I met a childhood friend at the airport. It's one thing when you go back to your home province to try and do pastoring and church planning, but when you go back to your home province, everybody knows you as you were. And some of you know my story, how I ran away from home in my teens and did a lot of things that embarrassed both God, my Savior, my parents, and my church, and all these things. And so I was at an airport, and I was in line, and this young uh, man was there that I grew up with. First time I ever sang publicly was him. And he asked me what we were doing, and we laughed and stuff like that. And he said, oh, I followed you on Facebook. He said, Bray, when did you become so religious? He said, I remember what you were like. He said, we got to go for coffee because I need to know how the punk from Harbor Grace is now religious. And you know what? I was able to look at him without fear or without embarrassment. And I said, Billy, I would love to tell you because you're exactly right. I am the punk from Harbor Grace. And the only reason I have anything is because Jesus Christ loves me. And I don't have to be afraid or embarrassed. And I don't have to hide because I'm forgiven. Now, let me ask you, how do you think that would affect the people of this city? We don't have to yell at them and scream. We don't have to win arguments. We just need to let them know, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. This will protect us from devouring each other, as Galatians tells us. You see, success in ministry is not drawing a crowd. It's not having a huge budget. It's not being impressive to the world. 
Success in ministry is making disciples and pointing to Jesus Christ. You see, the great confession of Matthew 16 gives way to the great commandment of Matthew 22, which leads into the great commission of Matthew 28. But I'm so thankful for John 17 because that's our great consecration. And so you won't find terms. You know, as I look out, I'm happy to see all different generations. You don't see in the Bible things like, I'm a boomer, or I'm a Gen X, or I'm a millennial, or I'm Gen Z, or Gen Alpha. You won't find that in the Bible. What you will see is people of all ages and sects and nations and tongues gathered together under one thing, the gospel and discipleship. Because when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So... If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, this is my king. The one who came and lived the life you and I could never live, die the death we deserve, conquered sin, Satan, and death, and gives us victory, something we could never get or attain. And now he lives, seated at the right hand of God the Father, praying and interceding for me, constantly reminding the Father of why I'm his child, and he will be your savior and your father as well. But if you're here as a son and daughter of God, are you compelled by this kind of love? Are you remembering that it's okay to bring your doubts and your fears and your struggles to Jesus, your father, and say, help me? Have you ever noticed when those little babies start taking those first steps? What's their first instinct when you stand in front of them? It's to put their arms out, isn't it? And what do you do? You would put your arms out and you just say, walk to me. Walk to me, even if it means you're going to fall into my arms. I'm going to catch you. I'm going to protect you. Are there Christians here? You need to start walking again. Because you're sitting in the seat of failure or shame or guilt or struggle. Let us be a church compelled by his love, knowing that Jesus has prayed for us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I am humbled and thankful for the patience and the attention of this congregation. Lord, I pray that you will look into my heart and mind, and these men and women will know that I did not get up here for show. I didn't want to give them a sales pitch. Lord, this is true because you said it. And it's true because I've experienced it. And I just want my brothers and sisters and friends here to know you this intimately. If there is one man or woman here and they've been doubting, they've been searching and they don't know you, oh God, today, would they know both the safety and security to come and ask for help to know Jesus? If there are men and women here who are Christians and they've been struggling with sin, struggling with their view of you, struggling and weary and well-doing, knowing that you are real, but feeling apprehensive, discouraged, doubt. Help them to know it'll be worth it all. Help them to know that it's okay to go to you in their weakness. Help them to read the Psalms and be reminded of how many times Thomas said, oh Lord, where are you, but I cling to you. Lord, may they read Psalm 23 and realize that's not written for funerals. It's written for the living. And help us to realize that our God is a good shepherd. And Father, give us hope and peace and give us resolve and mission this day. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. God bless you, church.